Well, I think we can get started while people are still coming in and taking their seats. Thank you so very much for coming today. There's a, there's a lot of competition on different tracks. But I, uh, I'm either very brave or very stupid or maybe a bit of both. But when I suggested to Bernie that it might be a, a nice idea to have a session on ethics at this meeting, he was really excited. And I know Bernie gets it. Sorry, are, are we still calling him Bernie or is he now the lawyer? Is that what we have to call him now? I also, I suspect that uh, the gentleman to my right was very excited when he got the invitation to come. I suspect he probably thought, really? Does an editor actually want to sit on a stage with me and, and just trade blows? Anyway, what we have for you today is, I think, something rather, rather unique. We've got an editor. I'm Graham Parker. The reason, uh, am, I, am I in charge of the, yes. So I'm in a division of pediatric neurology. As a, as a PhD, Gene will confirm I'm almost invisible. Almost invisible. Um, but I've become visible because I'm the editor-in-chief of Stem Cells and Development. And uh, yeah, Bernie was very excited by the thought of having this session. So what we have for you, for your delectation and possibly entertainment, is editor, big lab PI, Public advocate. Do you mind me using that phrase to describe you? Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, it's Ivan is. Worse, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to talk for a while just to set what I see as the ground base of, of the issues that come up in stem cell research and in particular reasons for why retractions occur. But really, this is just to give you time to think of questions. If anybody wants to interrupt me to ask a question while I'm talking, feel free. I prepare slides, but I never prepare talks. I just start talking, OK? So don't think you're going to interrupt the viewers. We want questions. We want there to be discussion. So I'm going to cover some issues that I think about and that I think other people interested in stem cell research and regenerative medicine should also think about. Uh, how stem cell research is represented between ourselves and to the public. We're going to talk about financial considerations, and then we're going to get to the scientific misconduct and what the consequences are for researchers of that misconduct. So let's start with hematopoietic stem cells. I always give this example because I think it's a terrific one. As far as I'm concerned, hematopoietic stem cells is still where we are in terms of clinical utility. There's a, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of progress being made. But this is really where we are. This is the clinical success thus far. Bone marrow transplants, we know how to store them, we know how to treat a number of conditions. And on a weekly basis, I get submissions to stem cells and development from researchers talking about how they're expanding hematopoietic stem cells much more successfully and how they can do much better things with those. So I've got a simple question for all of you. Why are the blood banks not full? Anybody know the answer? You speak to anybody that's actually involved with bone marrow transplant and ask them whether they want those stem cells cultured or expanded before use, they're going to give you a flat no. No. Not yet. We are tremendously bad at describing the true worth of the work we're doing. I'm sorry to say that, but we, we, we really haven't learned any lessons over the last 10 years when it comes to representing what our successes are. We have to become much more savvy on, on how we describe it, especially when relating to the public. Okay, when I first got into this field, we truly believed that you could take blood, shove it into brain, and vice versa, that really if you had a stem cell, you could do anything you wanted with it. And uh, I published a paper in the journal that I'm now the editor of, where we said we could take blood and turn it into brain. We truly thought that really any stem cell was a sensibly pluripotent. What we felt was that if you gave it the right conditions, that that would, that would occur. Why am I telling you this particular story? First, because it was my entry into the stem cell field. This paper has been cited a lot. I don't think it's right anymore. I think the data is fine, but the interpretation is wrong. I think we should be considering a new publication model where I can now, as an author, go back and add an addendum to that publication that points out to everybody, no, that's not what I think is the interpretation. We have to change it. Why is that important? It's important because this paper is still being cited by researchers as blood being turned into brain in support of basically clinical trials that are starting, 
which to me it's it's almost embarrassing that the paper's being used for that i think i think we have to think about how we can revise the publication model does it mean it should be retracted no because it was right at the time that was our best understanding but as i say i think we've got to think about it. are you asking a question sir Right. We did a tremendous amount of research with, with the local corpus stem cells, and, and we saw the same thing. We saw that we could turn them into the neuron producing culture. Um, and I think that in, in the last five or ten years, a lot of different groups have, have published similar findings. So, what is it that's led you to believe that there will be no utility or very little utility? Okay, I, I want to clarify. I'm not saying that there isn't a potential utility, it's just that the data's in that paper does not support that interpretation. At the time, we were pretty confident that Nestin was a neural stem cell marker. I mean, and it's not, but that's what we thought at the time. Okay, so that's an, an excellent example of how our understanding has developed, but the paper still stands and needs to be reinterpreted. Bernie. Uh, Okay, thank you, Bernie. All right, I'm going to go quickly through the slide because I think it's pretty obvious because I want to get on to our other speakers and, and to your questions. But when I first started in science, we really were seen as being like an ivory tower endeavor. There was, I was in psychology. There wasn't any money in psychology. Um, but things have changed. If you get an NIH grant now, you're going to get a pay rise by your, your institution. You're going to get promotions. That's even the, the most basic of scientists. There's money involved. OK, so here's, here's, here's the summary slide of what constitutes what most people understand as being misconduct. The fabrication of data, falsification of data, or plagiarism. I'm not going to ask you guys to rank the order in which you think is the most important. Um, the other thing that I think is always worth pointing out, and I'll, I'll paraphrase Shelley, that uh, errors and ignorance are transient, whereas genius and virtue are eternal. I, I, personally, I haven't been touched by genius, but I think we can all strive to be virtuous in the research that we do. But if there's an honest error, fine, you contact the editor and we move on with our stupid lives. That's, that's the way it should work. Unfortunately, as we'll find out, that's not how it always works. So, okay, as I've said a billion times, I'm an editor. I have to look at papers coming in every day, and believe me, stem cells and development gets a lot of submissions. And I look at the data for every single paper. I used to read every one. I don't have time to read every single paper now, but I look at the data. So I want you to tell me what's wrong with these data. Anybody? Um, they haven't got the sample size. They were on the figure legends. It isn't the sample size, but, but that, that's related to what the problem is. The definition of significance is the same, but you don't know the name for it. No, that's not it. Oops, let me go back. Have a look at the means and have a look at the variance. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. There are good people in the world who would be able to look at these kind of data for 14 days and they will never see that there's a problem with it. It was about five seconds before I rejected this paper, just because it, I'm sorry, I've become, I've become a, little, uh, a little cynical. What about this one? Probably not very obvious. I'll make it a little clearer. Can you see it now? I, I can't, but I know what it is. I'll make it even bigger. This is called blot by Sharpie. Then it's, it's so ugly that, that they really should have been ashamed to have even tried to, to get away with this. So that's falsification. The last one was fabrication. This is falsification. How easy is it to detect? I, I say, now I've seen everything. And the next week, I say again, now I've seen everything. It gets rejected. In that case, it was rejected, and I banned them from submitting for two years. Did they publish it somewhere else? That's your job, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> you can always ask them to 
prize funds in case of yeah. So this is the first scientific misconduct I ever caught. This was in a, a piece of scientific writing at my own institution, so I'm going to get into trouble for this, Bernie. A more classic romance of signaling elements isn't the kind of sentence you normally see in a scientific paper. So what did I do? I dropped it into Google. That's how I used to catch plagiarism. Now we use software. This was the sentence that I wrote in that paper I was describing earlier. I wrote this in the discussion. But the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Isn't that great? When I wrote that, I thought I'd written it for the first time. I was so proud of it. If you slip that into Google, <laughs> But that's just the words. If you put inverted commas around it, if you add the two words stem cells, how many hits do you think you get? Two. My paper, and the paper next that was published the next year describing the same phenomenon used the same quote, but didn't cite me. Now, is, is that misconduct? It's not really, but believe me, I was mad. Yeah. This is now the software that editors will use. Graham, yes. Would you, would you reject the paper? Did you see something like that? Is, is that man using a microphone? I don't think so. <laughs> when I speak loudly. Okay. At this I'm sorry, Bernie. What is it you're asking? No, would that be something that would reject the paper? No, absolutely not. What I'm trying to give is an example of something that isn't misconduct, but looks like it might be misconduct. There's shades of grey, as I'm sure we're going we're gonna to cover. But this is, the, this is what the software looks like. And I know for a fact that some of the editors are colorblind. How they interpret it, I really don't know. But if you ever get accused of plagiarizing, and you don't think you did, send it to me, and I'll have a look at it. Because this software can give an answer of 35% for a piece of paper that I will not reject. But it can also give an answer of 6% for a paper that I will reject. It's all down to where the text is that is actually copied from a different paper, whether it's methods. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to those issues. Other people are watching. Some of them are in this room. Claire Francis is actually a name I haven't heard for a few months. But what Claire Francis, whoever that person is or are, they email editors with a list of papers that they've found and they think deserve to be retracted. So far, I've only been contacted with papers that have followed papers in stem cells and development rather than the other way around. So I could just send them a nice email back saying thank you for letting me know. Deja Vu is an interesting website. The next website, do not go to. <laughs> never, never. Because if you do, you're going to get addicted. You'll go every day to have a look and see what the latest thing is. I'm sorry, but that's true. Never. Um, okay, here's some other... Uh, okay. Anytime you want to send an email to an editor because you're mad at a decision, this, is, this was... Have you heard the phrase salami publication? This is where you've got maybe four data panels in a paper that's a good paper. And then the next year, you've got some more data but it's really not enough to be a paper by itself. So you repeat the other experiments. So they're new data, but it's really the same story. Does that make sense? That's a salami publication. And I had one submitted to me, and I rejected it within 20 minutes. And this was the reply I got. Dear Dr. Parker, I'm quite shocked with your message. This manuscript is totally novel and interesting to feel. By the way, what is your impact factor? 10 or so? Now, it's, it's fun. It's fun to write an email like that. Just don't send it. I mean, I, I, you know, it, it, I, I can honestly tell you it's water for ducks back to me. I, I, I don't hold any grudges, but I just think it's really amusing that somebody thought that that was a, that was a good way to proceed. Inappropriate reviewer recommendation. I still get, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled why people think it's okay to list their PhD supervisor as a reviewer. And, and, and big, big people do this to me still. Listing a corporate reviewer, but with a fake email address. Now, there was a very big case last year or year before. Yeah, that's still going on. But the, I promise you, a month before that happened, I got a reviewer recommendation, but it was the person's name at gmail.com rather than their institutional email. And I sent them an email to the institutional email saying, hey, do you have an email address that's also gmail.com? And they replied, yeah, we do. And that's when I thought, that is genius. 
just list yourself, but with the person's name at gmail.com, that's very easy to do, and then you review your own paper. Ivan's going to cover that in more detail. I'm not saying do it, I'm just saying, yes. Microphone, please. The first bullet on the last slide, please. Yes. Can you explain that? Um, okay. Actually, this is the bane of my existence. I don't know why this is happening more and more, but it is, where a, a team of researchers will ask that another author be added that wasn't on the original submission after the paper's published. How, how you can suddenly discover that somebody else should have been an author really annoys me. Um, but you, you want the record to be correct, so you, 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 have to, you have to acquiesce. As long as all the authors agree and they say, yes, he did do, or she did important work that did contribute to the paper, then fine, we have to do a correction. But really, before you submit a paper, I think you should know who, who did the work. Okay, but thank you for the question. Okay, what are the consequences of misconduct? Now, the, the biggest in the stem cell field is, is what we're going to refer to now. I mean, when that hit the fan, that was big, very big. By the way, the dog Snuppy is real. That part of Wu Sa Kwang's work was real. What were the consequences for, for this gentleman of his misconduct? Anybody know? Did, did he do jail time? No. no. He's, still, he's still revered as a god in, in that country. Shameful humiliation that he went through. He hospitalized himself for a yeah. while. Yeah. By the way, I met Snuffy. Snuffy was the only thing that was real. Yes. He didn't wag his tail, didn't lick me. I figured he didn't like Florida lawyers. <laughs> Anybody want to take that? Nobody. <laughs> that he did get his patent issued on his, um, on his fake research. But that's what I thought you were going to so That's where about. lawyers yeah. come in. Yeah. He's still publishing. He's not publishing in my journal, but other major journals are accepted. I've, I've, I've stopped following his publication track record. But what are the consequences for, shall we say, normal researchers? There's the individual journal editorial decision, and as I've already mentioned, that can involve being barred from submitting to that particular journal for a couple of years. If you're funded by the NIH, you can be listed on their registry. It's actually quite disturbingly mild. Even the, the cases I've heard recently where people have done just incredible scientific misconduct. And, and, and what's the punishment? They're not allowed to sit on a review committee for two years. I would love to not have to sit on a review committee for two years. <laughs> Dismissal. This... Institutions have really got to get very much smarter, very fast, about how they deal with complaints of scientific misconduct on their researchers. I understand an institution might have dropped three million to set up a lab and a researcher, but when that researcher does something wrong, and they can see that that person has done something wrong, there's a very disturbing trend that I've noticed over the last five years, that institutions will back the researcher to the hilt until you finally say, no, I am going to retract the paper anyway. And then funnily enough, they dismiss the research of the next year. That actually did happen. But what happens in the meantime, certainly my estimation of that institution is, is sliding down. Removal of board licenses, collateral damage to co-authors' careers. This is, this, is, this is the absolute crime. I mean, we're going to talk about that. Uh, uh, certainly Ivan's going to discuss another case. For the trainees that are on a paper that gets retracted, that's, that's on their record forever. And sometimes editors even do resign. Right? <laughs> and they should do. Institutional damage, peer feeding frenzy. So thanks to certain people's websites, not only if you've committed scientific misconduct will they cover it, there are a lot of people in the world who are unemployed, but smart, and have computers. They have nothing else to do all day but to now go through your publication record. Oh, this is the, I don't know if this is interesting or not. Maybe I'll go past this. This is the timeline of the, yes, sorry. Uh, on your previous slide, yes. do, do you not hold all the doctors that equally culpable for what No, if, if all the co-authors agree that one person has done whatever the 
misconduct is, and that person also accepts that that was them that did it, then that's fine. It's not, it's not like I'm now going to, going forward, hold them all equally responsible for the misconduct. But it's still going to appear on the resume of, of all those co-authors. Obviously, if they're, if they're, they should list very carefully what their role was on the project and why the paper was retracted. So, it, it, no, it, it isn't that they're all held similarly responsible. The PI is held responsible. PIs have a responsibility to have a culture of, of zero tolerance for misconduct. Well, no, actually, one of the PIs for a paper I was dealing with just recently, he said, how can I avoid being accused of this in the future? How can I avoid being accused of this in the future? <laughs> to which I could re reply very quickly three words. Don't do it. Okay, this is, okay, this, this is an example of what I mean by the peer feeling frenzy. After the retraction of a certain paper that's going to get discussed, then people start looking at their other papers seeing whether there's a problem with any of the other publications and they'll go back through a, a scientist's whole career and then post and everybody seems to have a good time don't they Ivan? okay I concur, you're right, five times, impossible not to see that now that you've pointed it out that's true good honest scientists shouldn't be looking for, for these problems but once you point it out the consequences are getting more severe. People are doing jail time for scientific misconduct, especially the more hideous cases where the misconduct has affected how anesthesia is being performed in the United States. I'm sure you followed that one. I mean, that guy is going to do serious jail time. Um, Dietrich Staple is, uh, is an ongoing story. Okay, what is the cost of the field? Retired scientific progress, obviously. Misguides clinical treatment, as is famously the case with the, uh, the anesthesia. Diverts very limited funds. Diverts scientific efforts. Saps public confidence. Diminishes political support. And discourages trainees. I mean, they're going to go off and be a lawyer rather than become a scientist if you... If you... Okay, so that's me finished my part of the presentation. If you've got any questions for me, that's fine. Or we can just go on to, I think Ivan's going to come up next and, and give his presentation. Thank you for your time and uh, your patience. Hi, I've just got a question. I'm David Knapp from uh, BC Cancer Agency. Well, first uh, point, uh, in terms of you were mentioning blood stem cells at the start, that's the field that I work in. And uh, I've definitely noticed that uh, there's a lot of papers out there in the literature that don't use similar endpoints or thresholds for determining expansion. Many just use uh, engraftment level rather than an actual limiting dilution assay as well. Okay. So they're actually not numerically accurate. They're doing it based off of just a comparator. So I think that's actually quite a big issue in the field. And aside from that, I've noticed uh, if you look at some of the big publications, you have lists of 30 authors in many varied fields that you still only have usually three reviewers. What do you think about adding more reviewers? Because a lot of times you've got stem cell stuff, you've got computational biology, you've got a huge combination of different research fields getting together, but still three reviewers I don't think is enough to actually cover the full extent of most major papers anymore. It's, it's an interesting point. I mean, do you know how many reviewers an editor has to use to make a decision in a peer review journal? Not sure what the minimum is. None. So, I mean, I've sent papers out for review and got three reviews back and ignored all three of them. That's the nature of science and that's the, the responsibility of an editor is to interpret a review correctly. But the, the burden is totally on the editor to come up with an appropriate review for a paper. I've never had I don't think I've ever had an author come back to me and say, your review did not properly address my paper. I think it could happen uh, because, yeah, I mean, I, I can't be on top of every nuance of every field that could contribute to a stem cell paper. But that's, that's why you've got to carefully choose the reviewers that actually cover all the bases that is included on a paper. Okay? Okay, thanks. Thank you for the question. All right. Uh, I think the most 
up. Right there we go. Thank you. Um, good morning, and, and thanks to the summit for inviting me. Thanks to Graham for putting together a terrific panel here. Um, I, I will tell you uh, that I did tell my staff, um, and this is my day job staff. I have a very small staff at Retraction Watch now, but I did tell them where I was going, and I've tweeted about it. So if I don't make it out of that door, um, <laughs> there'll probably be some questions. Um, I have a sort of provocative title, and um, I promise to answer the question, uh, but I more importantly am hoping that all of you can answer the questions yourself. Um, and, and I promise the answer is neither yes nor no. It, as, as often is the case, it's, there's a significant nuance to that. Um, Adam Marcus and I launched Retraction Watch about four years ago in August 2010. Um, we have uh, been doing it uh, every day since then, or every weekday, and actually most Saturdays. Uh, we post a couple times a day. We have about 125,000 unique uh, visitors a month, and that, that continues to grow. And um, we have tapped into something that we didn't know was there. Um, or I should say, we, we tapped into something that we thought was much smaller than, we, than it, you know, it actually turns out to be. Adam was uh, quoted early on saying, yeah, we thought we'd start this blog. And actually, one of the things that prompted us was that this case that you mentioned, Graham, or we're alluding to, of Scott Rubin, who was a Vioxx researcher and anesthesiologist who turned out made up uh, enough uh, study, enough patients for 21 studies that had to get retracted. He did do jail time. Um, Adam broke that story, in fact, and you will get to anesthesiology in a couple minutes. Um, but that's really what prompted us, was that there were always stories, and in my, my own work, uh, as a science and medical journalist, I always found good stories behind retractions. And so, but we thought they were sort of few and far between. But as I'll demonstrate, actually, that's not the case. Um, Graham, oh, what am I doing wrong? Oh, there we go. Did I hit it harder? Oh, OK. Thank you, Graham. Um, so Graham actually alluded to uh, this this phenomenon, which this is just from Nature last week. Uh, you probably can't quite read it, but the byline is, is me, Adam, uh, Marcus, and Kat Ferguson, who's our staff writer now. Um, this is a, a feature that we did for Nature, it appeared last week, as I mentioned. And what it's about is the, this phenomenon we've seen. And now I should tell you that more than 110 papers have had to get retracted over the past two years because people were found to have been doing their own peer reviews. And I'm sure, I, don't, I won't ask you to raise your hands because you know, I don't want you to have to plead the fifth or anything, but if you could do your own peer review, I'm sure that all of you who are scientists in the room would choose to do that. Uh, after all, who is a better peer of yourself than you? Um, what the authors of these papers would do is, is, as Graham was suggesting, they would, when asked for recommended reviewers, they would submit the names of people who actually were legit researchers in the field. Um, you know, they might, you know, submit, you know, Ginny's name as, you know, uh, here's someone who should really, you know, be reviewing my paper. Uh, but instead of at Burnham or wherever your email address is, it was at, you know, gmail.com, okay? Um, and who had control over those accounts but the people who actually were submitting the papers? And so the first case of this we found was two years ago. Uh, it was a gentleman named Hyung In Moon. He's a South Korean researcher. And he studied uh, sort of medicinal plants, different compounds and things like that. And we saw what turned out ended up at the total of 28 retractions that had some language like the, the peer review process has been compromised in this paper. And that sort of set our, our red, you know, there's some red flags there. So we contacted the publishers in Former Healthcare. And they said, yeah, actually, and they explained this whole situation to us. And so Hyung and Moon took advantage of the fact that he could submit names of reviewers, recommended reviewers. The editors chose those reviewers. And then all of the, what, what nailed him, and those of you who edit journals, certainly Graham will appreciate this, but um, those of you who edit journals or have been asked to review, you understand that it, it's often like pulling teeth. It's often like really kind of pulling, calling in a favor to get someone to review and all that. And it's not necessarily the first thing you do every morning when you, you know, if you're a scientist, ask to review. The reviews were all coming back, coming back, not the review request was being responded to saying, yes, I will review it. The reviews were all coming back within 24 hours. That, that is essentially a statistical impossibility because of we're human beings. 
And so the editor, of course, got very concerned about this, got very suspicious, and Hyung and Moon conceded, you know, he admitted that he had done this. And like I said, there have been now 110 cases, 110 papers retracted for this purpose. In fact, Biomed Central just announced, as this was going to press, that there were another five that probably would. So the number, I think, will continue to increase. The hope, of course, is that it has plateaued because we've been writing about it, and now everyone hopefully is aware of it, and now that we've published it in Nature. But this is a real thing. Now, why are these things happening? Well, Hyung and Moon, it's funny because Hyung and Moon actually said to us, you know, it was a sort of classic, um, I don't know if blame the victim is exactly the right uh, metaphor, but um, a classic sort of response, you know, those editors need to be watching out for people like me. You know, it wasn't, you know, this wasn't my fault. It's that, you know, the editors are just not, they're falling asleep at the switch. I don't know how you feel about that, Graham. But um, again, it's, I guess it's why you, yeah, I guess it's why you hire, you know, hackers to sort of do your security, right? It's, it's the same sort of approach. Um, but what does this speak to? Well, it speaks to a lot, number of things that Graham was talking about, the pressures, the incentives, everything in science. And again, I speak as an, I, although I did train, I trained as a, as a physician and I published some papers and I'm, I used to work at JAMA long ago in medical school, but, you know, I'm really an outsider. I'm a journalist. Uh, whether I'm an advocate, I think is, it's an, I, I don't object to that term, but I, I think of myself as a, as a journalist and as a reporter, but I'm really an outsider is the point. And, and I will tell you that Nothing has convinced me that anything other than papers matter when it comes to science. Um, it's just, you know, yes, of course, grants matter and promotion matters and, and all of these things matter and citations matter, but it's all based on papers. And the fact that everything is, in, uh, papers are the only thing that are really incentivized. And of course, we know being published in the three, the top three journals, or whatever your field is, but uh, cell science and nature generally, the, the kinds of pressure people are under are going to make them do things that maybe they wouldn't have done otherwise or at least going to expose things that, they're being, that are happening. And so this story is not just about you know, the fact that some people were clever and there are vulnerabilities in peer review software. It's actually about what all the pressures are on scientists. Um, you, you won't be surprised, I, I think uh, most of you are probably familiar with the fact that uh, retractions have been rising. Uh, over over the last uh, really over the last decade and a half, but but pretty steadily before that as well. Um, this is uh, done by someone named uh, Neil Saunders, who's a bioinformatics um, a researcher in uh, New Zealand, uh, and, and it's a static image, so that's why that last 2014 at the end it, it doesn't look like it's as high as the others. It will get there. And by the way, I I, I never make predictions, but I wouldn't be surprised if the number of retractions. Uh, was close to 600 this year. It'll be at least 500. Again, that's over. That's but this is. And by the way, what's important here is that that's this is number of retractions per 100,000 papers. So it's it's actually a rate, not just an absolute number. And that's 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 pretty critical to understand. Um, but that's been going up. It doubled from 2001 to 2010, which Nature reported a couple years ago. Uh, there's something happening now. Uh, Graham talked about pleasure detection software. In the fact that we're able to look at images, millions of people are able to look at images if they want online, that's obviously playing a role. But there's also some evidence that, in fact, misconduct and fraud are, are really uh, on the increase. But that's an important thing to look at. And so, you know, causation is not, excuse me, correlation is not causation. Um, but Retraction Watch did launch in 2010. I'll just, I'll just leave it there. But Graham, Graham seemed confident that we were having some kind of, uh, I don't know if negative, positive or negative effect on the number of attractions, so I'll leave it there. Um, but I also want to say that, you know, in this, if you go back to my original question, does stem cell science have a retraction problem? This is part of the answer, okay, even though it has nothing to do with stem cell research. This is someone named uh, Yoshitaka Fuji. He's the current record holder. Uh, in retraction land. He has a, he's had 183 of them. They're, they're not actually all published yet, but they will, will be published eventually. Um, 183 retractions, um, that's a lot. Um, it's, uh, I, I've only published, I guess, like three papers, depending how you count it. So he has, you know, and he has, by the way, 40 papers that didn't get retracted. So he's still way ahead of me and will get tenure before I do. Um, but Fuji, okay, is an anesthesiologist. Now, number two, record holder in anesthesiology, excuse me, in refraction watch land. And, you know, he was very disappointed when we had to call him and ask him to send the Guinness Book of World Records uh, medal back to us so that we could send it to Fuji. Um, uh, he was also an anesthesiologist. Uh, Scott Rubin, who, uh, who, who Graham and I both mentioned, anesthesiologist. 
Um, nowadays, to break into the sort of top five, you know, you need to, you need, in, in case any of you are sort of either hoping to do this or encouraging others to do it or whatever it is, uh, you, you really need to break 50. So don't, don't get too excited. Uh, people often ask, I've taken at the end of our posts where we're sort of doing counts, like there's this, uh, there's a research, a chronology researcher named Kato who looks like he's going to have to attract 43 papers altogether. Um, he's up to 33, and people often write in comments who haven't been sort of following it. Uh, oh, is this going to be a record? And I'm like, yeah. And he can't possibly have a record. He hasn't published enough papers. Um, so it, it's kind of an impossibility. Uh, but, and they're from all countries. Uh, Bolt, who is number two, is, is German. Um, uh, uh, Scott Rubin is, is American. I mean, it, it, this, we, we actually... Uh, we haven't written about every single country in the world yet, but just yesterday we put up something, our first, I don't know if anyone here is from uh, Azerbaijan, but uh, it was the first entrance of, an, of a researcher from Azerbaijan under Traction Watch. We're very excited to be able to put up a new category. And I don't know how often we'll use that one. Um, but the U.S. is still the winner overall, but obviously it's, they also publish more papers. The point is this, is, this is one person with 183. When you look at trends, you have to look at outliers as well, and he's really one of them. So why are papers being retracted? Um, I won't go through all the various reasons, and we have a whole, we actually categorize all of our posts. If you're interested, you can go, and there's a whole by, by reason for retraction. We've, uh, we've, we've got to fix some technical, technical issues with it because we just migrated to a new server. But there, there are about a dozen of them sort of grouped together. So, and it's everything, again, that falls into that area, the FFP. Um, uh, sort of uh, definition that, that Graham was talking about. By the way, as a side note, um, so I mentioned I, I trained, I, I went to medical school and graduated. Um, so when I first started thinking about misconduct and I first started thinking about retractions, I, I kept seeing ethicists and uh, people interested in these issues talk about FFP. And I think this crowd will probably you know, definitely understand why this is confusing to me because when I was in medical school and, and when I was an intern, um, FFP was fresh frozen plasma because you had to, I was the one who had to run down to the lab and match the blood and get it to the patient who needed it and all this. And I, I just couldn't for the life of me understand why the ORI, the Office of Research Integrity, and all these ethicists were so interested in fresh frozen plasma. What was the issue? But I turned out to have the wrong acronym. So here's a paper that came out about two years ago now in PNAS. By the way, if you're interested in retraction stuff and interested in sort of some of the misconduct, uh, Farrakh Fang, Grandstein, and Arturo Casadeval do tremendous work in this area. I don't say that only because this paper uh, very heavily cited Retraction Watch. Uh, I say it because they, if you go through the sort of canon of literature, and Adam and I actually have a paper in press, it should be published any day now on, online, um, in, in a journal uh, that is looking at, it's a review of, retract, of the literature about retractions. What does that literature tell us? And so we used to think, actually based on Grant's work, previous work, that fewer than half of retractions were due to misconduct. It actually turns out about two-thirds are due to misconduct. The reason why those are different, even though it's the same data set of retractions, is because the notices in retraction, in, in retraction notices are not usually as detailed as the one that Graham showed you from his own journal in a case that I'll talk about briefly. Uh, generally, they are completely useless. Um, they, and, and by the way, useless is better than being misleading or wrong, which some of them are as well. So that's what Adam and I do, is, and, and Kat now too, we find the real reason for the retractions. And when you do that, and you look at other press reports, they looked at reports from all over the, all over the world, um, you find that, in fact, misconduct is behind a lot of what, and Graham, you'll have to forgive me here, editors sort of use as mealy mouth language to make it look as if it's something else. Okay, so let me run through some examples of stem cell retractions, many of which are probably familiar to you, certainly the ones that have the stem cells in development um, cover or familiar Graham. Um, this is a, you know, a, a sort of, I, I wouldn't, nothing's particularly typical in, in, in our world, but this is a case where there was a misconduct in the Korea. They found that uh, there were problems, and uh, what they said was in, inadvertently and erroneously switched with another. Uh, these were images, figures that were problematic. Um, and so this, this was retracted, uh, and it was retracted before, if I'm remembering right, before the inquiry actually was completed. Is that right? No, it was after, afterward. So that's not that's that's pretty typical, and both are actually typical. You might have it before, you might have it afterward, but you know, figure image manipulation, a very common reason for attraction, as as Graham showed you with the sharpie, the Western blot sharpie. That's um that's something that happens a lot. 
Um, this is a, a case that actually has come up more recently, um, and this, this bit of it nobody seems to remember, or at least nobody's you know, sort of reminding people of. Um, this is, of course, uh, Paolo Macarini, who was called, uh, I don't know, the Italian, uh, well, it is an Italian term, but super surgeon. Um, he created a, uh, you know, an artificial trachea, and you've probably read about this, just in the last couple of weeks. Um, and Graham actually pointed me to a story where they're actually reopening this investigation. Well, before all that, or, or sort of as I was all starting, um, this paper was actually uh, retracted because just for reproducing a table, so in other words, plagiarism. So plagiarism can happen in any field, and it happened to someone who probably has many, more, many deeper problems if I'm, if I'm reading things correctly. Um, plagiarism can also be a reason. Um, this is a story that, and, and I think in the interest of time, actually, uh, and then Graham showed the, the, um, the notice, but it's a very complex story that, that happened in Australia at, at uh, Queensland University of Technology. Um, and, and Graham really is probably the best place to discuss this one in any case. But I think that this case is a really good example of someone, in this case a grad student, trying to do the right thing, um, being constantly silenced by basically everyone he tried to speak to except certain people who you, you may see in this room, um, and who actually ended up really, I mean, he, today he's, he sort of may get his PhD, it's actually unclear, and everyone kept saying, no, 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 there's nothing to this, but in fact, what happened was the, uh, the, uh, one of the, two of the authors had to return a $275,000 grant uh, because of the misconduct that happened in this case. So whistleblowers, they may be annoying, um, a lot of them may be sort of just annoying people in general. Uh, a lot of their approach may be annoying, but the scientific community can no longer, if it really wants to be thought of as a trustworthy group of people, which I actually do think of it as, but certainly to, act to outsiders, it can no longer simply ignore whistleblowers who may not want to give their name because they're vulnerable, for example, which a lot of editors just simply won't talk to someone who's anonymous, uh, who won't give their name. That's, that's problematic. Uh, another one, uh, sorry, Graham, I just, uh, you do publish stem cell journals, so that, that sort of, well, a lot of these are coming up, but again, another, some more fabrication. Um, and, and I think you're going to talk more about the, the STAP, so I'll, I'll leave this for a moment. I, the only thing I want to leave you with from this, because of course STAP was a major story in, in your world uh, this year, uh, a very unfortunate story with tragic consequences. Um, this is, th what happened here was that someone leaked us the uh, peer reviews from science, and as you all know, science had rejected the paper. So that, that's my way of saying two things. One is that if any of you would like to leak me anything today or another time, we can exchange cards and I can take it all anonymously. Uh, but more seriously, uh, that will happen. And regardless of whether the journal is an open peer review journal or not, um, these sorts of things will happen. And that may scare some people, and I, I can understand that. But it also means that there is a level of transparency that I think is a, a really good thing. And again, we'll hear more about that case in a bit. Um, but let me give you a little bit, and I'm going to pull back a little bit. Actually, annals of thoracic surgery is relevant here because it's where the Macarini paper, Macarini paper was published that I mentioned. Let me pull back a little bit and give you a not uh, sort of atypical uh, experience that Adam and I have when we try and talk to people involved in, in misconduct cases. Um, that's Hank Edmonds. Hank is a uh, he's a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon at University of Pennsylvania um, in Philadelphia. Um, and those of you who know cardiac surgeons or are cardiac surgeons, you know that they're not typically wallflowers. They're pretty, you know, strong-willed people, which is kind of what I want in a cardiac surgeon, to be perfectly honest. But <clears throat> anyway, so there was a paper that was published, and then it was retracted. And Adam looked at the retraction notice and. There was some information in it, but it didn't really say what had happened, and, and Adam wanted more information. So he called Dr. Edmonds up, and he got him on the phone, and um, what, and the, what the, the sort of punchline was, it's none of your damn business. That was his first response. And Adam said, well, actually, we do think it's our business. Thank you, Dr. Edmonds, for two reasons. One is, um, this is taxpayer-funded research, so it literally is our business, so that, that's going to have to go out the window. But even if you leave that aside for a minute, people are making decisions People who are, whose loved ones are, you know, going on the table under anesthesia, anesthesia uh, having heart surgery. Based on this, we, we actually do think it's our business. He, he kind of went on from that, and it became more entertaining, so we left, we actually published the whole transcript. Um, he, he likened us, he said, you know, if people, uh, if you get divorced, people don't have the right to see your uh, divorce papers, your divorce settlement. 
<clears throat> so Adam had to think very quickly. He thought, well, do I ask him, oh, oh well, tell me about your divorce, Dr. <laughs> uh, Dr. Edmonds, um, or do I actually ask him what, how that's relevant to um, what we're doing, which is, you know, the, the beginning of the word publishing is pub public, right? Those, those happen to share the first five letters. So anyway, this is not a tip. We also call this uh, blogists, which is a term we hadn't heard before, but I, I, I don't know, ists. Ists are not generally, it's not generally a good thing, but that's okay. So let me, let me shift gears a little bit. I hope, by the way, that the answer, that you will, you will agree uh, with me when, when I say the answer to my initial question, does stem cell science have a retraction problem, is, uh, who, says, who says yes? No, a one, two. A retraction problem. Well, I'm just, I'm not even allowing you to go beyond yes and no yet. So I, I got so a few yeses and no. Wow, there's a, there's a lot of abstentions. Okay, this is a, thought, this is a thoughtful group. Or a non-committal one, I'm not sure which. The answer is yes, but so does everyone else. Okay, science has a retraction problem. It is beginning to fix it. it there are lots of good movements, which I will talk about here. Um, but my point in tweaking you with anesthesiology and with the question is, everyone does. I go and I speak to groups of psychologists, and they actually, you know, have to, they actually have to have uh, metal detectors at the doors, because I won't make it out if alive, if, if, you know, they see all the things that we write about them. And yet they too, are, they are no more, you know, they have no more problem than anyone else. But this is part of the reason why. Now, my spin on the sort of uh, the crowdsourcing, if you will, the, um, what Graham was talking about with the feeding frenzy is a little bit more positive, as you might imagine. Um, PubMed, Pub, this is PubMed Commons, uh, which I actually comment on. Anyone who's published a paper can comment on it. Um, this is actually tremendous, despite our headline, which we did want to take them to task for not allowing everyone to comment, but that's okay. Um, is a tremendous step forward. It has allowed a lot of people to correct papers, to comment on papers. It's terrific, and you have to give your real name and all of that, which I think makes a lot more people comfortable reading it. I can understand that. Maybe fewer people comfortable using it. That's one aspect of post-publication peer review. But let me walk you through a stem cell story now that um, hopefully you, you will probably recognize that did not involve a retraction. Uh, that was not the punchline of this, but you all, uh, I, I don't have to tell you this crowd about this paper, you, you're all probably familiar with it, and I would probably either get it wrong or insult your intelligence by describing it. But this came out in, uh, in last uh, May in, in, uh, in Cell, pretty important paper. And then, oops, sorry, that was not supposed to be there, that's supposed to be somewhere else, okay. Let's skip that. You're, you're going to talk about some of that stuff anyway. Um, or I can come back to it. Uh, so within uh, a few days, and, and as you probably all know, that paper was sort of rushed into print and, and into publication. It was, you know, from submission to publication was about four days. It's pretty remarkable. Um, now here is something called PubPeer, PubPeer.com, which I urge all of you to check out. Uh, we're big fans of PubPeer. And this is a, a, an entry that started just a few days after that paper was published. And I just want to highlight um, one of the comments. It does, however, have several images of image reuse, which might be of interest to pub peer members and readers. Now, uh, those of you who are academics or talk to academics on a regular basis, like I do, know that when an academic says something is of interest, they don't mean it in a good way, even though it looks externally like it might be a good thing. It's not. Um, of interest means you should check this out because there's a problem with it. Um, and then the, the, the comments went on from there, and they were very straightforward, and this, you know, this gel looks a lot like that gel, and this looks like this one flipped around, and this looks like this other thing, and then it was all very, you know, here's what I think. Well, um, we called uh, Elsevier, we called Cell, and they said, yeah, actually, we're, we're aware of that now, we're, we're looking into it, thanks. And then a few days later, they actually decided to publish a correction. They didn't publish the correction for several months, um, and that may have, had the fact, have, may have had something to do with the fact that this was a 740 word correction, which is pretty impressive for a cell paper that's only a few times longer than that, um, and involved most of the figures in the paper. And, and again, I'm not here to have a discussion about retraction versus correction. I actually probably think that correction was right, and this speaks to the sort of haste at which this was published more than anything else. Um, but PubPeer is responsible for that. that. I'm very confident in saying, you know, cause-effect relationship here. 
PubPeer has done that multiple times now. The commenters on PubPeer, it's an anonymous site. Again, lots of people don't like it because it actually allows people to critique papers, which is something that some scientists are not comfortable with. But it has led to all sorts of things like that. Journals are listening. This is a site um, called Abnormal Science, which reported on these on problems in five of these papers, which eventually were retracted. The, sub the expression of concern was first. Journals are actually paying attention. Not all, but some. Many journals, in fact, are paying attention. They're paying attention um, and they're doing things proactively or somewhat proactively. Uh, the Journal of Cell Biology, um, we, excuse me, Journal of Biological Chemistry, and I don't mean to line the Journal of Cell Biology, I could probably do that too, but the Journal of Biological Chemistry uh, is famous in our world for publishing one line useless retraction notices. This paper has been withdrawn by the authors. It doesn't tell me anything, and it quite frankly is insulting to readers, but that's another story. Anyway, they got tired of us saying all that all the time. And so they actually hired someone. You know, in, in the world of, uh, in politics, of course, when you can say that you're a job creator, that's a really good thing. So Retraction Watch is a job creator, so I can maybe run for office someday. Um, and then finally, I just want to say that um, doing the right thing actually might pay off. You know, I, I may come off sometimes, Adam and I probably come off as uh, not quite misanthropic, but sort of somewhere closer to cynical than, than skeptical, um, and maybe we are, but actually we're pretty optimistic guys. And one, this paper came out um, about a year ago now and, and actually made us smile, uh, believe it or not. This, and again, it's only one paper, let's not make too much of it. Evidence that if you went and did the right thing and said, you know what, I made that honest error, and we, you know, we heard from, about honest errors from Graham earlier, you made this honest error, I made this honest error, I'm gonna attract this paper for that reason. Not only do you, does the stigma of retraction not sort of not apply to you, you don't have a, a sort of decrease in, in your citations, you actually have an in, a slight increase in your number of citations. Whereas if you, you know, fight and kick and scream and don't retract and are forced to because of obvious fraud and, some, and that's what the retraction notice says, then you actually do see a dip, not only in, in your citations, but in your whole field's citations. It's actually a fairly disturbing thing, and maybe we should all think about each other a little bit instead of just you know, our own publication record. So we'd like to think that doing the right thing is a good thing. We, we agree on that, and it may actually help in the long term. That's how to find me and send me lawsuit threats, which a lot of scientists like to do, um, or hopefully tips and things like that on a more serious note. So thank you, and I look forward to more discussion. I have a quick question. I, I actually like all three of your opinions on since you have different viewpoints. Um, how do you feel about, um, in terms of reviewer fraud, or if you consider it reviewer fraud or not, when PIs who are asked to be reviewers get their students to do the reviews instead of them actually doing the reviews? Probably, well, yeah, probably best for, for either of you. I mean, I, I, you know, look, I, I think my understanding is that that's a very common practice, and so it may be so ingrained in the way that things are done that it's not considered fraud, and we never sort of decide whether something's fraud or not. We let the community sort of judge those things, which is why I probably should let two of you. Yeah, so what I'm you know. I, I do indeed have, usually not my students, my postdocs uh, do reviews, but what I do is when I'm asked to do a review by a, a, a journal editor, I send a message back saying, do you mind if I include this particular person as, um, as my co-reviewer? And, um, and then I have my postdoc uh, review the paper and I also review the paper. It's a learning experience for them which they really do appreciate it. So I, I don't feel guilty about um, fobbing off work onto my postdocs because this is something they're gonna have to learn how to do. And I feel like as long as the editor is aware that that's the way I'm reviewing the paper, they can always say, no, we don't want you to do that. So I don't know if everybody does that, but and I know but I, I think it is, it can be really valuable for, to postdocs especially to be able to review papers. Sometimes I completely ignore what they said because they were picky or nasty or something like that. And I point out to them that's not how you review a paper. So that's my solution. Okay, I guess I can ask my question. 
Um, I know that we've been talking a lot about uh, retraction in general and how this is kind of affecting the science field. Is there any sort of vulnerability specifically to the stem cell research? And this is just a question to the, everyone in general. I, I think Ivan pretty much covered that. I, I don't think there is anything particularly special about stem cell research. It's just that st stem cell research engenders so much enthusiasm and public scrutiny that I think when something goes badly wrong in stem cell research, we hear about it. If, yeah. if something goes badly wrong in paleontology, you know, I'm not saying entomology, but you're not going to hear about it in the same way. So I'm, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to, I'm, I'm going to talk very briefly because I really am more interested in having a discussion with people in the audience, but um, I was, uh, I was at a meeting um, oh, six months or so ago in which I ran into an old friend that I'd known since graduate school. Um, he works on imaging, he's really very good at it. He's a professor at Caltech and he said, um, he said, how do you know uh, when a stem cell researcher is hyping their results? Their lips are moving. It's really tempting. I mean, I can understand because one of our obligations is to be able to explain our work to the people who fund us. And so uh, sometimes we get a little carried away. I'm going to bring us back around right now to uh, the, the major cases everybody knows about in stem cell uh, research. And um, my, my reason for doing this is really to let you know how things, um, uh, there are some heroes here that I want to point out. There are people who manage to get papers um, retracted, often at the cost of, of their, own, um, uh, their own careers or their own uh, peace of mind. Um, the Wong case, of course, is what uh, brought everything to the forefront. And, um, and um, uh, Wu Suk Wong fooled a lot of people, including um, a lot of people in this room including me, including Bernie, uh, we thought that he had actually achieved this, um, the cloning of uh, humans for the first time. And um, so his, the, what I wanted to point out was that, oops, I knew I'd do that, um, is that his paper was published in Science on March 12, 2004, and he, he became a, a national hero almost immediately. Um, but it took um, a bit more than a year before a young researcher in his lab um, stepped forward and, and um, left a uh, message in the tip-off mailbox of the website of a TV news pro program in Korea called PD Notebook. Um, he, uh, he was um, taking a, good, a really big chance with his... Um, with that kind of tip-off, but it took him a long time to decide to do that because Wong um, was a national hero. You can see uh, that he quickly, he fell very hard and very fast once that started. So this is the hero, the fellow up there in the upper uh, right-hand corner. <coughs> he was the anonymous um, postdoc who uh, reported uh, that Wong had lied about the number of embryos, or the the number of oocytes that he has obtained um, in order to make these cell lines, and also pointed out that the cell lines were, uh, there were a lot of, of questions about whether the genetic analysis actually revealed that the cells had been, were really clones. So, um, and he suffered quite a bit. His, his, uh, this, you notice that this was published in uh, January 2014, so it took a long time for him to come out. It wasn't, uh, it was simply not acceptable. And as we've learned, of course, Wong is still with us, and he's, uh, he's now moved into a partnership with BGI in, uh, in China, the genomics company, and is setting up a company for cloning, uh, starting with cloning animals, of course, but who knows where he'll go from there. So he hasn't really long-term suffered as much as the person who outed him. Um, but you'll notice in this particular article in January, um, maybe you can't read that, but it's, uh, it's reporting the, uh, this new uh, paper in, that was in Nature on stop cells. So simultaneously with one person outing the, um, the paper from long ago, is the publication of the next paper, which became the next big story in stem cell retractions. And that's this one, um, the stop cell 
paper, which I think we're all familiar with, um, it was a very attractive story because it suggested that the, it was extremely easy to make RPS cells. Now, for someone like me who makes RPS cells using Yamanaka's methods, I thought, well, that'll save me a lot of money if I can do it this way instead. So, of course, um, we had a lab meeting, and one of my postdocs, all, everyone in my lab wanted to try it. But I said, go ahead and try it. Tell me about it afterwards, but don't tell me when you're doing it. Tell me what the result is. So, um, interestingly, along with my lab, um, one of the real heroes in this story is Paul Knopfler, who um, runs an IPS cell blog site. It's, he's extremely, um, uh, he, he takes on really difficult issues. And this is one of the ones he took on. Um, and it only took um, eight days uh, uh, for Paul to post a uh, request for people to post the results they, when they were trying to reproduce the step work. And it only took people about a week to try to reproduce the step work. And it failed over and over and over again. Um, so um, that, I think, was uh, gave the impetus for uh, the, the hero in this story who is uh, Ken Lee, uh, to, um, to live blog his attempt to do exactly the same thing that the, um, that the researchers in, in Japan had on it, Rican. And um, so he would post daily results of his experiments, his attempts to do exactly the same thing that had been done before. The rest of us were much more casual about it, but there were a lot of us. There were a lot of us who tried to um, to reprogram cells using this method on our particular cell type and failed. So this paper also was retracted, and um, again, there was a hero. Um, what I want to show, point out, though, is that you know, this time, instead of a year and a half, it only took um, a week until people started um, noticing that they're, and, and commenting publicly. So what do these things have in common? Uh, these particular stories were published. These uh, were published in very high-profile journals, uh, Science and Nature. The Wall Street Journal and the New York Times read Science and Nature. So, if there's anything that sounds interesting, it's bound to show up in the national press and then the international press. Um, in each case, the institution or um, the the institution or the or the or the country, in the case of one. Um, excessively publicized the, uh, the finding, which um, of course led to everyone thinking it was, it was a great idea and every scientist wanted to try it. Um, the, uh, in each case, the scientists themselves were, were um, was, it was a personal hero. Um, there were, new, there were um, news stories, there were stories of, uh, of uh, Wong, um, uh, surrounded by um, all the people who, who um, loved him because he had done something great for Korea. And, um, and similarly in Japan, there were stories from the lab and um, explaining um, how really important this was. Um, and there, was, there became an issue of national pride in each case, which I think made it very difficult for the scientists to back down without letting their country down. And then I think most importantly that the people who were really responsible for uh, the investigation were volunteers and they were young scientists. They were the ones who actually read the papers. How long has it been since you've read past the abstract of a paper? It's been a long time for me. I know. Um, so they're the ones who actually read the papers and try to reproduce the results. And they were, um, and, and this would have remained a secret had they not posted their uh, attempts. Okay, so um, when we talked earlier about what it is that we wanted to discuss with people, I think this is a pretty complex and wide-ranging kind of issue, but, but I, we, took a, we, we came up with a few questions which we can use as discussion points, um, what we can do about this, these events happening. Um, for example, who really bears the burden of responsibility, the author, the editor, the reviewer, who is always off the hook, um, or the institution of the, um, the person who's committed fraud. Um, should the institutions um, take more responsibility um, in the submission of papers from their faculty? I know I would find that an intrusion, and I would hate it. Um, so how international are the conventions for publication ethics? So I, I think the answer is they're not very inter, um, international. There are certain countries that have different ethics. 
And I think we have to, since all the papers come to English speaking journals, English journals, and are edited in the US or UK, then we have to uh, consider the fact that some Asian countries have uh, different criteria. And they, they see nothing wrong with, with certain uh, things that we find um, uh, improper. So um, again, intrusively, should institutions require proof of, of lab book verification? And good luck with that. And um, are really the personal consequences of fraud se severe or not or enough? I mean, uh, if you, is retraction of a paper actually have some impact on the person who is responsible for the fraud in the first place? So I actually asked my group, I have 20 people in my lab, and I, and I pulled them a bit to try to find out what their questions, the things they thought were important. And some of these are very specific, so they, they're maybe there aren't things we want to talk about, but these are the things that come up in discussions with the people who are actually writing the papers. Um, so is it plagiarism if you copy just a little bit of somebody's methods in uh, your paper? Um, if, how about if you copy parts of your own publication? Is it, uh, are you allowed to plagiarize your own doctoral dissertation? Can you just lift it and put it into your publication for your first publication after you get your doctorate? Um, and this is an important question. What if you discover that you can't repeat your own published work? Should you retract it? There was an issue that Ivan was going to bring up about a paper that was published a while ago by Doug Melton's lab in which he identified a, um, a, a hormone, which he named beta-trophin, which had the effect of uh, enhancing the proliferation of beta cells in the, in the pancreas. And that was a very big deal. What journal was it in? Uh, that was in Cell. In Cell. And then uh, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, um, Doug and also another group from um, Regenera, I think, um, essentially showed that, that was, it was just not true. It turned out that he, the effect he saw was, uh, was only in three mice out of the seven that he looked at. And once he looked at more mice, he found that he couldn't reproduce the, the effect. And yet he renamed this gene beta-trophin because of its effect on proliferation. So the question I have in my mind, and I'm not going to answer it because I want you to think about it, is does Doug Milton have an obligation to retract that paper when he learned himself that it was incorrect? I'm leaving that for you. Um, now, the other issue is about authorship, and we brought this up just a little bit. Is it wrong to add an author, author who did no work? Of course it is, but people do it all the time. Is it wrong to publish work? And I've, and I've started talking to a lot of people about this, because this has happened to me, um, unfortunately. Um, is it wrong to publish work that you did in a formal lab without acknowledging the lab? Um, I've had this happen to me. One of my postdocs left my lab and started publishing work that was done in my lab and leaving my name off of it. And I found that really annoying, but is that fraud? Is that, I mean, is that misconduct? Um, how bad, um, and, and how bad is it if you forget to acknowledge your, uh, a grant? And honestly, when, um, when Graham was talking, I thought, you know, the last thing you think about when you're, you're try trying to get a paper in the publication is the author list, getting that right, spelling the names right, getting the right authors in there, and the acknowledgements. And a lot of people just sort of gloss over it. They don't actually think about it. And it ends up, they end up leaving stuff out or, or including mistakes. Um, and so the, then the question for, for uh, editors, of course, is how easy is it or how can you fix mistakes once you discover them without having to retract? So with that, I'm going to return to our, our host <laughs> and uh, see what you guys would like to address. Yeah, let's get some questions from the audience. Does this work now? I think it does. Well, I'm going yes. to answer one of your questions there. Rather hilariously, I asked a researcher to review a paper because I thought it was really his wheelhouse, the, the work that was described. Yeah, not only was it his wheelhouse, it was his work. And the postdoc had left the lab and then submitted the work to my journal without any mention of that lab. Oh, me and the PI had a good laugh about that one. That's so funny, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, hi. Um, I do some research on ethics, and I interview a lot of scientists. And I've been interviewing about 100 in the US and 100 in the UK, specifically on ethics and science, and uh, a lot of physicists. And when I talk to the physicists, they all tell me this is something that happens in biology more. 
because they feel like we lack some kind of standardization um, and reproducibility within biology and specifically I think maybe stem cells might be this area where there's not as much standardization. I think I've talked with uh, Graham before a little bit about this. Um, so I was just wondering is it the role of the journals to bring in kind of this idea of standardization? I think the other person asked a question earlier which kind of I think leans towards this of uh, standardizations of kind of protocols and is that what we're kind of missing that will help us with the reproducibility issues that we're having some of the retractions that are maybe not in your fraud area but in generally or that uh, if we're trying to be nice saying that it wasn't fraud it was a slight error kind of issue. I think, I think we'd all like to make a comment on that one, but I'll start if that's okay. So I think it's, it's very important to understand the difference between what is a data set that is misinterpreted and what is misconduct. So what, what we're talking about now is where someone's done an experiment and a subsequent attempt by somebody else to do the same or a similar experiment may well fail because we're just not very good yet in stem cell research, I would say. I mean, anybody who's bumped into me knows this is a favorite hobby horse of mine. The, the inability of stem cell researchers to agree upon even the name of the stem cell they're looking at, let alone how they culture it, how they then perform an experiment on it is, I mean, if, if, if you spoke to a chemist about how we t talk about it, they would laugh in your face they, 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 for the lack of standardization and, and rigor that we apply to our, even our terminology, let alone our methods. So I think that's, that's why your, your physicist friends are, 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 are able to make hay at our expense. Mm. I, I, I would agree with that. Um, and, and obviously, Graham is, is very pleased to say that than the, the, in any case. But I, I think there are other differences between physics and uh, biology that, uh, in terms of publication, that they're mentioning, and that you, you may have, you know, you may be focusing on this particular thing today, but I'm sure you're aware of. You know, physicists have archive, and biologists are now starting to use archive. And those of you who aren't familiar with archive, this is a preprint server, so you actually post your paper before it's published for the community to look at. And so before the physicists invented the internet, or Al Gore, or whoever it actually was, um, some, yes, British guy, of course. Um, well, before that, the physicists, because it's a much smaller community of people, used to send around in, you know, 500 copies of a particular paper, and everyone would look at it and give critiques before it got published. Economists do the same thing, except that economists actually simply never actually published. That's a, another interesting question. But so the fact is that there aren't that many attractions in physics, although we're starting to see some more because there's so much review, really public review, before anything gets published, that you know, you've at least sanded off the rough edges, if not sort of you know, you know, made it much better. And, and I think all these other issues make things, you know, if you will, worse in biology as well, the, the nomenclature and things like that. I mean, do you see any differences in the retractions in biology versus, for instance, physics or chemistry? Or are you just mostly focused on biology? We, we cover what we find, and we, we actually don't cover everything we find because we don't have the, the people power. Um, we have far fewer retractions, as I mentioned, in physics um, and chemistry as well. Um, the retractions in physics, uh, it's interesting. Some of the, a lot of them, and, and I think it's only because I really don't know physics very well, but they seem very poignant to me. They, they often like, they have this, you can hear like a sort of violin playing in the background when you read it to yourself because it, there's like a sadness about what happened. And I think it's because people aren't as invested and maybe literally invested financially in what's happening. Um, but again, also because it's a smaller community, everyone really knows each other. Again, you, and I would differentiate sort of high energy physics from, you know, theoretical physics from, you know, other sort of physics. But, um, so there are some differences in the actual notices, but the numbers are much smaller as well, even if you will per capita. In other words, per 100,000 papers published, uh, there's still many more in the life sciences. So I want to give you a practical example of, of in which standardization has actually worked, and that's the, the genome. Um, if uh, when I first started studying uh, genomics, um, way way long ago, far too long ago, before the genome was was uh, was sequenced, um, there if you if you look at a at a site like OntiGene, you'll see that there are five, six, ten different names for each gene. And there has been a concerted effort to come up with a 
unique identifier for each gene and a, a naming uh, mechanism for that. So um, this is, you'll find out if I review your paper, I will make sure that you use the official names for every gene and uh, you actually write the name of that gene out. Now I think editors can actually enforce that and it's starting, I can see it starting to come around. Um, like the official name for OCT4, what's that? It's this really awful thing, but, you know, but the official name is PLU5F7, 5F1, sorry, PLU5F1. And so whenever I write about the OCT4, I put the real name, which is PLU5F1, and then I put in parentheses also known as OCT4. And I think it's, it's really, I think the, the real importance of this is that um, a lot of, uh, of search engines actually look at the text. Uh, what's going to happen is that people are, people's papers are not going to be cited if they use the wrong name for the gene because it won't show up in a, um, in a, in a text search. And so that's my rationale. That's how I, that's how I impose this on my own lab. I'm um, saying this nomenclature is going to last. And so in 10 years, if somebody's looking for your paper, they'll be able to find it. But if you use this other name, it's not going to be in use anymore. And nobody will be, ever cite your work again. You, of course, require people to use the real names of genes, right? Well, we'd like it. <laughs> it would help. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. I don't have a question. Um, there's a little bit of a disynchronicity in the real world and what's going on in stem cell biology. If you do fraud in the real world, you sell false real estate, you go to jail. In the stem cell world, and we're talking not about a small financial incentive, the financial incentives here are huge. And what these people are doing is fraud. And they need to go to jail. And we have to, when you start seeing that there are um, uh, consequences for illegal activity, then you will see that this will be, because as it is now, there is no punishment for these jokers. That's my comment. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting. Graham, I think, gave some examples of people who actually have gone to jail. They, none of them were stem cell uh, per se, right? I don't, I don't, yeah, no, they were, I mean, Scott Rubin and Eric Pullman, um, they're a handful. They're, Adam and I actually wrote a, uh, an op-ed in the Time, New York Times um, over the summer where we looked at a particular case. And I want to tell you the story in, in not total detail, but some detail just to, so you understand some of the steps because I think that um, you know, what we saw in terms of everything that had to happen for the Huang case and for the stab cells is, an, is another example of this. And this was outside of stem cell work. But the Office of Research Integrity, ORI, last December, about a year ago now, uh, submit, they posted a finding about a, per, a, a researcher in at, um, Iowa State University who had faked the results of an HIV vaccine in rabbits by spiking the blood samples with human antibodies to HIV. To, to, I think it was GP120, but to something in HIV. Um, now this broke uh, and probably would have completely been, you know, just ignored, except that um, we saw it. It was Christmas week. It was like two days before Christmas. We wrote about it, and I contacted a friend of mine at the Des Moines Re uh, Register who wrote about it, and that went to USA Today. I ended up on CNN from my mother's living room, grandmother-in-law's living room, which was sort of interesting for its own reasons. Um, anyway. Fast forward, Gra uh, Chuck Grassley, and you may all have strong feelings one way or the other about Chuck Grassley, senator from Iowa, Republican, um, he said, what is going on here? This was like $19 million in federal grant funding, and this guy is just being, he was allowed to resign, and that was it. Nobody's giving any money back. He, he sort of, he just tightened that, that you know, that winch uh, bit by bit until there's now, and we don't know what the result will be, but uh, again, long story short, they paid back a lot of the money, um, he now, he faced criminal charges, a very rare situation, and he now has a plea bargain in front of him, which I'm, I, I, he must accept because he, he already confessed to it. But that's a very rare case, and so Adam and I pointed out, in the, in the history, in like last 30 years, he'd be like the sixth person to even face criminal charges, let alone go to jail. And so I think we do have to think about that. It doesn't mean they should all go to jail, but facing criminal charges should be in the, you know, not having to serve on an NIH peer review committee um, should, should not be the worst kind of punishment. Hi, um, enjoyed the meeting, the talk so far. My question is, do, um, does the publishing industry 
have a responsibility uh, in terms of screening out basically garbage research. And when I say garbage research, I mean stuff that is not really st statistically significant. I've worked in the islet field for 20 years now, and I see in the stem cell field a lot of parallels with hundreds and hundreds of publications with, with sample sizes that just make the conclusions you know, essentially worthless, and yet they're published time after time and time again. And that's what leads to, I think, a lot of the problems where people, I mean, it definitely feeds your business in terms of retractions, but I guess the question is, does the publishing industry, should it set up a screening? You, you say you do it for terminology, why not for the statistics behind the results? I, I, so I think you know what the answer is going to be. The publishing industry is an industry. You're going to have journals that are accepting a payment for a submission on, and then a subsequent publication of the paper. Those, those kind of journals, those online journals that are accepting payment of $1,500 in order to publish a paper, aren't, you, you can't expect them to be following a virtuous publication model that we would be looking for and that as academics we would we would hope to see. Yeah. Yeah, so the Melton paper is interesting for a couple of reasons. I didn't review it. I didn't review it either. <laughs> I, I, you're not supposed, you're no. not supposed to reveal who the reviewers are. Right. I was not one. Okay. <laughs> well you've, you've just revealed that you weren't the reviewer. <laughs> That's very important information you've just put out there. No, I, I'm just going to briefly comment on that paper in that it's a wonderful example of how you uh, plot data can majorly affect your interpretation of that data. And sometimes you can, you know, if, if you're the PI of a big lab, and we haven't even touched that image, that issue that I think we should be touching is the responsibilities of the PI for what goes on in their lab. But if you're the PI of a big lab and your postdoc excitedly comes and shows you a data set that's based on the raw data versus the percentage data that look really exciting and catches your imagination and your fire and you say, okay, let's get this written up. That, that, that's a problem and that's, that's not fraud but that, that is a failure. The thing I, always, I give talks on, on, on publishing papers, the thing I always tell the students is you have to plot and replot and replot your data. Get totally lost in it. See it from every possible angle to make sure that you are interpreting correctly what it is you're looking at. And I think the Melton paper was a, was a perfect example of where a data set pub, uh, graphed one way told a story, but when graphed in a more appropriate manner, revealed that there, there was not a significant effect. Do you think that's fair, Jean? Yeah, I actually, um, I review a lot of papers. Um, I don't review enough papers, I realize that, yeah. I keep saying no because it's a lot of work and I take it really seriously. So, um, I, you know, it's really, along with everything else that, that PIs are doing, to be able to, and then things like papers from Doug Nelton, Doug has a very good reputation, so that definitely has an impact. But I think I, um, I think the N of seven would have raised my concern, and I probably would have brought that up. I don't know whether I would have noticed the way that it was plotted, but I've seen the comparison of different ways of plotting it now, and it's quite clear. Graham is exactly right. It's, it's, what really bothers me is that, the, that it actually got published. It went through all, it went through the PI, presumably it went through other people in the lab. I mean, there were a number of authors on that paper, and yet, nobody said anything wrong with it. So, anyway, that's, that's, that just happens way too frequently. And probably I bear some of the responsibility for that because I don't review enough. When I start getting paid to review, I might consider it. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry, that was a, that was a specific question. The uh, journals usually have a list of things they want you to look at, and statistics is one of them. Um, and then how closely you look at that will, will pretty much do, depend on whether statistics is your main occupation or not. And so since it isn't for me, I mean, I do care about it, I usually um, send it to one of my bioinformatics postdocs and ask them. So at least I'm covering it. Of course. 
Yeah, I mean, so, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to quickly answer. So uh, many journals will, in fact, have a statistician and that will see every paper that's published. But I don't, because my background is psychology. I know how to do statistics, and I know how to that's interpret it correctly. So, so it, believe me, you, you'll get annoyed at how much rigor I will ask for you. Um, but please, ask your question. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask and have you guys comment on um, whether you see a difference in retractions, misconduct, errors, you know, scientific er errors between industry and academia, whether there's a, any kind of comparison there. So this is something I get asked a lot. Um, and the very easy answer, if you will, the one that where the data just say this, are that um, the vast majority, and, and I'm talking basically all, uh, retractions uh, are in basic science for one, so there's not ne there isn't necessarily an industry uh, involvement. You know, sometimes there's some funding or what have you, but um, in terms of actual industry sponsored or industry performed, you know, research, you know, sponsors and all that, um, it's very, very rare. And there's actually someone um, named uh, Karen Woolley, who's, uh, she's in Australia, she's a, um, uh, medical, she's a, I think she has a PhD or an MD or she's definitely a doctorate of some kind who does medical communications and does, you know, writes papers, helps people write papers and things like that. And she's published a paper which I, quite frankly, full disclosure, and I've said this before, I think is deeply flawed, but, you know, arguing because of that, well, therefore the, you know, rate of uh, misconduct is much lower in industry funded, you know, work and, and things like that. Um, I would argue uh, that the real problem in industry funded work is the way that studies are set up. And it gets back to the, excuse me, statistics, in fact. Look, you can set up a trial to, to prove whatever you want. Um, and that, you know, you do have to have them registered now with clinicaltrials.gov and all that. But um, that's the real problem that we're looking at in terms of industry-funded research. Not out and out fraud. It is a very heavily regulated industry. And I think that fraud is actually vanishingly small. That being said, you've seen some pretty major cases recently with Novartis and some others, uh, Pfizer, um, that have involved fraud. So, I, you know, again, the quick and dirty answer is there's far more in basic science and in life sciences and in academia. That doesn't really, you know, tell you the whole story. So with the explosion in publications in this field, there's been um, a concomitant increase in patenting and patents have a very different level of rigor compared to publication. N equals one is good enough for a patent application. No statistics are necessary, and the bar for scientific and hypothesis testing is very, very minimal. Plus, one cannot, cannot plagiarize in a patent because they are contracts rather than copyrighted. So just the uh, speculation here, perhaps, with many of these publications, perhaps they're first published in the patent literature as provisionals. Is it possible that they then become the skeleton, the outline for the subsequent publication? And so that's why we see poor statistics or we see very, very poor hypothesis testing. So um, just maybe commentary from the uh, panel yeah, I, here. I think that's interesting because I, I used to work in industry. I was at Insight Genomics. And we had a, we had a high throughput patenting um, department. I mean, we, we were doing high throughput sequencing, but we also did high throughput patenting. And I have patents on three genes, which is nothing compared to my colleagues. Um, I think what I found, um, what I did not like about being there was that uh, they were very happy with us filing patents, but they didn't want us to publish. Um, I think the, um, and it, it, it's very dependent on the institution. And I think you're right in some cases that the patent actually becomes the paper. But um, we have to keep in mind that they're, the value of those two things are quite different and relatively different depending on the investigator and the institution. I, I certainly agree with that. My institution is the same. I'm allowed to patent, but I'm not allowed to publish. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is because at the time of filing, the best mode is what's necessary to file. And if subsequently additional best modes are discovered, then the institution is obligated to divulge that right. to the patent office, and hence you're divulging that to all of your competition. Right. That's right. And, and I understand. I just, uh, the thing is about biotech is that I, I think there is, if you're going to have good science in biotech, you have to let, you have to encourage people to publish. Um, and I, and so we have to come up with a solution to that somehow. I mean, it, it's, it's so dependent on, this, on the CEO and the culture of the company. Thanks. 
So I just want to say that uh, every t uh, I'm Bernie Siegel, and when we organize the uh, summit, there's always one panel that I always circle, the one that I feel like I want to see the most, and uh, not even the ones that I'm on, but it's the uh, this one. Uh, I'm so glad we recorded it, and I've been texted with updates, and I was able just to, to briefly sit in. I want to thank this panel. I would like everyone in the room to thank the panel for their uh, wonderful presentation. And this will have a shelf life, and then we're bringing on the next panel, but I just wanted to thank you, Graham and, and, and Jean and Ivan, for, for doing this.